Why should you be infatuated, my son, with a loose woman and embrace the bosom of adventurous? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnares him, and he is caught in the toils of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because his great folly, and because of his great folly, he is lost. That is the wisdom for the day. Interesting. So, yesterday's episode, the mission, I talked about uh, the wisdom from yesterday was let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her affection fill you at all times with delight and be infatuated always with her love. And so this one picks up, why should you be infatuated, my son, with the loose woman? And so the context here in Proverbs 5 is, um, it's the warnings of, you know, the whole thing is about adultery, and it's the warnings of, of, you know, of a loose woman. And so kind of like what I'm hearing here is, like, let your, you know, the other, yesterday was, let your fountain be blessed, let it, you know, rejoice in, in your, the wife of your youth, so we have this woman, our woman, our wife, that we should allow her affection to fill us with delight at all times. And so it's like, if we have that, then why would we want to be infatuated with a loose woman, right? It's kind of like the whole concept of um, why go out for, what is it? What is it like? Why go out for burgers when you've got steak at home or something like that, right? And so... The key thing that stands out for me inside of that, um, inside of that reading is, quote, he dies for a lack of discipline. And I want to touch on that word discipline. You know, what, what comes to mind when I say the word discipline? Um, many think of discipline as like punishment, right? When the root word of discipline is disciple. Okay. And Jesus had 12 disciples of which who were committed to the journey. These men were committed to the mission that eventually, you know, Christ was going to bestow upon them. And so discipline doesn't mean like punishment. Discipline is commitment. And, you know, it, I, I find it interesting that the first thing, this is an observation. The first thing Jesus does when he starts his ministry is he organizes a gang of better men, a gang of men to mentor. That's his first thing, right? He's going along the shores. He sees Peter and Andrew and he calls out to them and he calls them to follow him. So he begins to build his community first. And these men left everything. They left everything and they fully committed to Christ. These were men of commitment. And so that is what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to have discipline. Discipline is not punishment, right? We usually think of it as like, oh, I mean, I did something wrong as a kid. And uh, now I feared of you know, being disciplined by my parents, right? And it could very well mean that, right? And it does mean that. But discipline is not just punishment. It's also commitment, right? And so in the context of this reading, it says he dies for a lack of discipline. He dies spiritually. We die spiritually because of our lack of commitment. We lack discipline in the five elements of a strong man, being strong in your mind, in your body, in your emotions, strong spiritually, and strong in your community. And if we don't allow ourselves 
as of yesterday's, you know, yet my yesterday's podcast, if we don't allow ourselves to receive love from our wife, right? If, if we, if we block that love that she's trying to give us and we are as men, we're physical creatures as humans, we're physical creatures. We, we need the touch. We need the physical embrace. If we deny that love from our wife, We'll seek it. We'll seek to receive it elsewhere. We'll seek to receive it from another woman. Because, you know, you'll hear guys say things like, oh, we just fell out of love. Nonsense. Right? You don't just fall out of love with your wife. You know, I was, um, I used to go to this, I used to go to this um, networking event um, that I, that pretty much helped me build my entire business when I was getting the gym up and running. It's called BNI. Business Networking International. And I uh, met a lot of business owners there. And there was one business owner there. He became a customer for, for probably about a year. Nice guy, you know, from, from what I know of him. And um, as I got to know him in the group, and we would do what we'd call these one-to-one meetings. It's where you meet one-to-one with another business owner in there. You get to know their business. You get to know about them. And it's going to help you to better refer you know, find referrals for this person. So I got to know this guy fairly well, you know. And then one day he announced to the whole group that um, he was going to be moving and he was going to be, you know, resigning his seat from the from the chapter, but that he was getting a divorce. And I'd met his wife, sweet lady. He was getting a divorce. And he said that this is what God wanted, that he prayed about it, And this is what they felt was best for both of them. Wrong. God would never lead a man to divorce his wife. That is just us justifying our selfish desires. God will never lead a man to divorce his wife. That is the enemy lying to you. That is the devil lying to you. If you don't believe in the devil, you've got another thing coming. And these are the stories that, again, these are the stories that we tell ourselves to fulfill our own selfish desires. And when we have these thoughts, okay, because that's what your brain does. Your brain is on autopilot 24 hours a day gathering information because that's its job. It's designed to keep you alive, keep you safe, avoid pain and seek pleasure. Okay. And so when we have these thoughts, this information that comes in, our mind then goes to work to discern those thoughts. So the next time you have thoughts like this, whether it's, it might necessarily, it might not necessarily be divorce and maybe it might be. Take time to investigate the stories that you're telling yourself and challenge those stories. Ask yourself, what evidence do I have to prove that this story is true? This is how I was able to overcome many of my bouts of self-sabotage that I shared in yesterday's episode. What evidence do I have that this is true? So this was back in, I was in this transition. I'm still running the gym. This is like 2019, 2018, going to 2019, just had the liver surgery. I'm building the better man program and um, I'm working like crazy hours. I'm even, you know, once or twice a year, I'm traveling with strong first teaching certifications and um, just working all the time. And I'm creating this men's program to help men become better men. To help men become stronger in balancing the five elements of a strong man. Balancing, the key word that I just used there. But yet here I was working crazy hours, literally I mean, getting up before my kids woke up, coaching at the gym, then coming back home just to get them ready, lunches, take them off to school, then work pretty much all day, pick them up, go back to work, coaching, um, 
running the gym. And then when I was done running the gym, finished coaching at around like seven or so, seven or eight, I would come home and then would work on the Better Man program, work on emails and work on all of, you know, product delivery of our programs online, like work and editing videos, doing that until one or two in the morning. Wasn't seeing my family. And so here I am trying to teach these men to do this, but yet I'm doing the opposite. And so the story I began to tell myself was I'm a fraud. And then ultimately that like story and that problem that you create on that is the same story and problem that keeps you from solving the problems. You kind of fall into this like vicious cycle. And so I had to get real with myself, face myself and ask myself, what evidence do you have that you're a fraud, right? That's the story. What evidence do you have that that is true? So I, had, I, go, I went through this whole series of self-reflection and getting clear on these stories and really just kind of calling out these emotional sensations that I was having. And it helped me to realize, you know what? I'm not a fraud. Here's the truth. Here are the facts of the case. Right. So that, that took time to go through. And this is the exact stuff I, I had the framework to go through because this is exactly what I teach the men of better man. And so the same for you, man, I, I encourage you when you begin to have these, these thoughts, these desires and whatnot, challenge yourself, ask yourself, what evidence do I have that this story that I'm telling myself is true? Okay. And so that is, that's the key thing that stood out to me there inside of um, the daily wisdom. And so I want to dive into these two readings real quick, peel them open. This was uh, yesterday. First reading is from Acts. Let me see here. So setting the scene again, Paul and Barnabas are out fulfilling their mission. It says there is an attempt in Iconium by both the Gentiles and the Jews together with their leaders to attack and stone Paul and Barnabas. They realized it and fled to Lyconian city to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derby. Hope I'm pronouncing those correctly. And to the surrounding countryside, where they continued to proclaim the good news. At Lystra, there was a crippled man, lame from birth, who had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, who looked at him intently, saw that he had the faith to be healed, and he yelled out to him in a loud voice. Stand up on your feet. He jumped up and began to walk about. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they cried out in Lyconian, quote, the gods have come down to us in human form. They called Barnabas Zeus and they called Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and he together with the people intended to offer sacrifice. The apostles Barnabas and Paul tore their garments when they heard this and rushed out into the crowd shouting, quote, men, why are you doing this? We are the same nature as you human beings. We proclaim to you good news that you should turn from these idols to the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all Gentiles to go their own way. Yet in bestowing his goodness, he did not leave himself without witness. For he gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and filled you with the nourishment and gladness of your hearts. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. So again, 
we will all suffer to some extent, right? Is just as Christ has suffered for us. Okay. Paul and Barnabas. I mean, look at Paul and Barnabas. It's just an example. They were literally sought to be stoned to death. And I believe in tomorrow's readings, <laughs> they, they actually do stone Paul and like leave him for dead, basically. Now, our situation, our, our, I mean, it might, but our situation, our hardships may not be as extreme as being stoned to death. Um, I mean, but just look at the look at the situations going on here. Like, let's just say in the U.S. as an example, people being canceled and whatnot. At some level, we'll all encounter resistance in our pursuit of proclaiming, sharing the gospel, um, because it's ultimately glorifying God is what gets us to heaven, right? So there's a few things um, that stood out to me that Paul that Paul did. So in that first reading, Paul sees this crippled guy, and who's lame from birth, has never walked in his entire life, and this guy's listening to Paul proclaiming the gospel, and Paul notices him, and Paul notices like, man, this guy has faith that he will be healed, and so Paul just straight up tells him, stand up straight on your feet and the guy jumps up and walks right and so i love how paul and all of the apostles speak with authority and i think many of us we don't do that i know i have struggled with that a lot to speak with that kind of authority knowing that it's going to be done for you knowing that it's already done and this is a lesson for us to all to follow like when we read these things and we see the things that Paul and Barnabas and Peter, we see all these things that they're doing. That is, that is a model. That is a blueprint for us to follow. That's why my program is called Better Man Blueprint, because there are several men and women who provide us with the blueprint of virtue, of a virtuous life. So we are called to not be timid in our kingship. You're a king. I'm a king. We are baptized through the by virtue of our baptism, we are baptized priest, prophet, and king. We are called to preach. That's our expressing our priesthood. We are called to prophesy over our family. And we're called to govern our family, our kingship. That is our authority. That is our sovereignty. We possess the same exact power. Here's the great thing. We possess the exact same power as Paul, Barnabas, and the apostles. God gave Jesus breathing and God gave them the Holy Spirit. We were also given the Holy Spirit at our baptism. <laughs> and the part where the Jews are, so the, the, these, the people in this city, they're like, oh my gosh, like Zeus and like Zeus has come down, like the gods have come down. And it's interesting that here they are, they're, they're worshiping Greek gods, right? And it's like, they haven't learned their lesson. Like, if you look at the history of the Jews, like there, there's this constant, like, up and down and up and down. And it's just like, man, they haven't learned their lesson. All the times God has blessed them, done things for them, and they, yet they still continue to turn from God. Eventually, they're exiled, Jerusalem's destroyed, they're captives in Babylon. And it's like, it just keeps, it just seems to continue to get worse. But, I mean, has anything really changed? You know, um, you know they work, continue to worship false gods, false idols, and nothing's really changed because here we are as people, me, I continue to not honor God the way he, that he should be honored, right? And I think we all go through this. And I think it was Jordan Peterson who said, like, what would happen if you truly believed in God? Like we say we believe, right? What does it mean to believe? And these men, Paul, Barnabas, all the apostles, everything they do is always to glorify God. This whole mission, thank you, Paul said multiple times, it is necessary for us to go through hardships. And it would be easy for them to make it about them. Because I mean, look, Paul is, he healed this dude. He healed this crippled guy. 
and it would be easy for him. The crowd's like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Oh my gosh, you're the gods. Like how easy would it be for our own selfish passions and desires to, to be like, oh man, give me, give me the love, give me the respect, give me all this. Like it, it, it's in a way, it's part of our nature, right? To be, to feel valued. Um, I mean, what would I do in that situation? You know, what would I do when, if that's something like that happened, right? These are things that I ask myself. Because it's easy to get caught up in our own glory, right? Thinking about how great we are. And remember, just remember everything that we do as Christian men is to honor God and to give him the glory which is due. And I love what uh, Bishop um, Olmsted said in his book, Emmanuel for Men. He says, never deny Christ the gratitude that is due to him. And so Paul and Barnabas are giving us that example. They're freaking tearing their own clothes off and entering the crowds like, stop, no more sacrificing. We are not gods. We are just like you. We are the same nature as you. We are regular humans. And that leads us to the gospel. The gospel, this is John 14. The gospel's really good. Pretty short one. It says, Jesus says to, his, says to his disciples, and I love this part. He says, whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. Whoever loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. Judas, not the Iscariot, said to him, Master, then what, hap then what happened to you? <clears throat> he says, Master, then what happened to you will reveal yourself to us and not the world? Jesus answered and said to him, Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my father will love him. And he, we will come to him and make our dwelling in him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the father who sent me. I have told you this while I am with you. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you all that I told you. You know, it's interesting that, you know, God comes down to earth three times. God comes down to earth three times. First, God came down in the beginning. Right? He came down in the beginning, created Adam and Eve. Spirit flew over the water. Then eventually God comes to us in the person of Jesus. And now God's going to come to us in the third person, the Holy Spirit. It's very interesting. God comes to, God comes to earth three times. And so I love the way this gospel stands out. And it is, again... Jesus, these are not my words. <laughs> these are the words of, of Christ. This is why we as Catholics hold the Ten Commandments of such high value. Many people think, oh, no, that's the old, that's the old law. You know, if, you got, if you're going to follow the Ten Commandments, you're going to follow the law, you got to follow, follow all 600 plus laws. No. Those are laws that, like, Christ honored those laws. He didn't come to abolish them. He honored them. But they started making up all the stuff on their own. And that's why he eventually came and said, hey, look, you know what? Here are the new commandments, which is a summarization of the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments are essential. We must follow those because Christ says several times in the gospel, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Who, and then in this reading, whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. And I like what he says, I will reveal myself to him. And so I'm thinking, okay, I will reveal myself to him, right? If we keep it, if we keep his commandments, he will reveal himself to him, to me, to you. And so what is Christ? Christ is truth. Christ is, you know, the way, the truth, and the life, right? But particularly Christ is truth. And the object of our knowledge must be truth. So the object of our knowledge should be Christ. So Christ will reveal truth to us. 
So I'm asking myself, okay, well, the truth of what? The truth of ourselves, the truth of our identity, um, the truth of every question that we've ever had. And so the, the disciple replies back to him. He's like, master, then what happened that you would reveal yourself to us and not to the world? So Christ is like, I'm going to reveal myself to you and not the world. So it's like, if I'm understand, if I'm understanding Christ at his word here, he will only reveal himself to those who keep his commandments and not to the rest of the world. Because he says that whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. Whoever loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and reveal myself to him. So he's going to reveal himself to him, me, you, if we keep his commandments. So if I'm understanding Christ at his word here, then this makes sense. In fact, it makes even more sense because it's one of the Beatitudes. I think it's in Mark's gospel. It's in one of the Beatitudes where to see God is to, to see God is to be pure of heart, right? It says, blessed are the pure of heart for they will see God. And if you're not pure of heart, you're spiritually blind, right? And this is where St. Joseph comes in. I'm getting ready to unpack my entire journey of uh, my consecration to St. Joseph, Really excited about that 33 day consecration. The story of how it ended it was crazy. And, uh, but I want to, I want to read to you a pat, uh, a couple of pages from, um, father Calway's book. I don't know if you can see this because of the blurry thing, my jig that I got, uh, father Calloway's consecration to St. Joseph. Uh, it's horrible. Anyway, I want to read to you a couple of pages from that because I mentioned this the other day. <clears throat> the biggest challenge, the biggest sin of men today is impurity, right? And so if you're impure, you will not see God. You'll be spiritually blind. And as, if I if I can take Christ at his word here, I will reveal myself to him if we keep his commandments, if we remain pure. Right? And we remain pure by not committing adultery, which is one of the Ten Commandments. So I'm going to read to you. Um, Joseph has many titles. This, is, this book's amazing. I can't wait to unpack this for you guys. Um, one of which is it's his money. <laughs> it's his money name. And it's called the terror of demons. I'm actually reading another book. I'm reading, I just started a book right now. It's called the terror of demons. And it's about, uh, regaining, um, traditional Catholic masculinity. And, uh, but I want to read to you the terror of demons. <laughs> this is so good. So this is from, uh, father Calloway's book. Um, consecration of St. Joseph. I've got so much stuff on my desk. It's crazy. All right. After the Virgin Mary, demons fear St. Joseph more than any other saint. The devil fears St. Joseph more than he fears the Pope. How is this possible? Isn't the Pope the vicar of Christ? Yes, but the Pope is only the vicar of Christ. He is not the father of Christ. Now, before you freak out, if you're not Catholic and this sounds like complete blasphemy, bear with me. Because a lot of people get this twisted. 
the father of Christ, the vicar of Christ has authority over the mystical body of Christ, the church. But St. Joseph has the extraordinary gift and power of paternal intercession in heaven. So here's a quote from Blessed William Joseph Charbonnet. It says, The power of St. Joseph is greater than that of the ancient Joseph, of Moses, of Joshua, and of St. Peter. The power of St. Joseph is truly extraordinary. He alone bears the title, the terror of demons. What makes this unique title of St. Joseph so extraordinary is that St. Joseph was not a pope, a priest, a monk, or a martyr. St. Joseph is a layman. Like most laymen, he is a father and a husband. It is his loving fatherhood, in particular, that gives St. Joseph extraordinary intercessory power. Have you heard of Blessed Bartolo Longo? who lived during the 19th and 20th century. He was born in Latiano, Italy, to a devout Catholic family. As a young man, he studied law at the University of Naples. After being swept away by various political ideologies, he became anti-Catholic, radically opposed to what he believed were the old wives' tales of Catholicism. Within a short period of time, He went from adhering to nationalistic ideologies to becoming involved in spiritualism. Spiritualism isn't good. This led him to attend seances and to become an ordained priest of Satan. Bartolo's involvement with the occult and spiritualism left him empty and unhappy. He suffered from hallucinations, torturous nightmares, frazzled nerves, bodily ailments, and severe depression. Seeking guidance, he turned to a friend and a Dominican priest and began to experience a radical conversion. Fearing for his soul, he renounced spiritualism and its practices and turned back to the Catholicism of his youth. In gratitude for having been delivered from the occult, he became a third order Dominican and dedicated his life to the spread of the rosary, especially by renewing the Catholic faith in the ancient city of Pompeii and building there the Basilica of Our Lady of the Rosary. He was very devout devout to St. Joseph, prayed to him every day, and was particularly fond of his title, The Terror of Demons. Bartolo had such a great love for St. Joseph that he wrote a lengthy book of meditations and prayers to St. Joseph to be used for the month of March. Bartolo Longo, the former satanic priest, was beatified by St. John Paul II in 1980. Here's a couple of quotes from Bartolo about St. Joseph. It is a great blessing for souls to be under the protection of the saint whose name makes demons tremble and flee pronounce often and with great confidence the names of jesus mary and joseph their names bring peace love health blessing majesty glory admiration joy happiness and veneration their name their holy names are a blessing to angels and men and a terror to demons Christians should always have the names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph in their hearts and on their lips. That's Blessed Bartolo Longo. Father Calloway continues, The life of Blessed Bartolo gives us more proof that the wonders of St. Joseph are without number, and the devil is terrorized by all of them. The father of St. Joseph, the fatherhood of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The humility of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The charity of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The poverty of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The purity of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The obedience of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The silence of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The suffering, the prayer, 
The name of St. Joseph, the sleep of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The sleep is interesting because every time Joseph slept, that's when God came to him for in a vision. And the, the devil had no way to plan for that because the devil doesn't know your mind. He doesn't know your thoughts. He doesn't know your heart. Only God knows those. So God would come to Joseph when he slept. And that's when he gave him all the visions, the dreams. And that's when Joseph acted on those. So that's what he means by the sleep of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. He says, of the wonders, two in particular need to be emphasized in our day. The fatherhood of St. Joseph and the purity of St. Joseph. These wonders of St. Joseph need to be highlighted because all men, laymen, and clergy need to realize the power that fatherhood and purity have over the forces of darkness. All fatherhood is a threat to Satan. Look at our society today, man. Like the world, and it's being pretty dang successful, is trying to remove fatherhood from the world. It is trying to remove pure fatherhood from the family and is doing a great job of it. Because Satan hates fatherhood. For centuries, the devil delighted in the reality that so few Christians pray to St. Joseph and call upon his paternal intercession. Today, God wants to make St. Joseph's fatherhood known and replicated in the world. This terrifies Satan. The devil knows that the intercession of St. Joseph is cap- what, what the intercession of St. Joseph is capable of doing. If men resemble St. Joseph, the kingdom of Satan will be destroyed. Satan hates motherhood too. It's why he went after Eve. It's why he went after Eve in the garden. Because he thought he got the woman wrong. So, right, angels have infused knowledge of God. They know everything about everything the moment God creates them. And so Lucifer, Satan, was the highest of angels. And God revealed to him his whole entire plan of creating the world and creating humans and coming down and loving them and and uh and that he would put his own son into the world and that all angels and everybody would 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 honor these people. And that he was going to create a woman who was perfect, Mary. But Satan didn't know who or what woman he would refer to because he just referred to her as the woman. And so in the garden, that's why he went after Eve first because he thought she was the woman that God was referring to. But it wasn't. And that's why he went after the woman first. He went after, he went after and sought to destroy the very thing that would bring life into this world. No wonder women are being objectified today. uh, Porn, you name it, strippers, you name it, prostitution, you name it. And he, and Adam did nothing to protect his wife. And here we have today, men are doing nothing to protect their wives and their daughters while the devil destroys them. And so he hates motherhood for that. Satan hates motherhood too, of course, especially disdaining and fearing the Virgin Mary. Women are the bearers of life and the devil hates life. Satan hates fatherhood because of the inherent power in all fatherhood. All fatherhood has its origin in God and finds its earthly model in St. Joseph. All fatherhood has the power to combat evil. Lucifer fears the fatherhood of St. Joseph more than any other creaturely fatherhood because the devil knows there is no created person who has a greater participation in the fatherhood of God than St. Joseph. I'm going to repeat that. Lucifer fears the fatherhood of St. Joseph more than any other creaturely fatherhood 
because the devil knows that there is no created person who has a greater participation in the fatherhood of God than St. Joseph. So Joseph was chosen by God to be the earthly father protector of his divine son. No other saint, no other person can say that. This is why next to Mary and Jesus, Joseph is the most powerful saint ever. The devil is infuriated by the fact that God humbled himself to become a man and submitted himself to the fourth commandment, honoring your mother and father. Again, why the commandments are so essential. For one, the devil hates them. And Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, if you honor your mother and your father, and if you honor my mother and my father, then you love me. It, 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 it makes me laugh when people just, Christians included, particularly Christians, where they're like, ah, Mary, Mary and Joseph, those are just like, no, it's all about Jesus. And yes, it's about Jesus. But they just dismiss like, oh, Mary was just a vessel. Are you kidding? Mary's just a vessel. So what you're telling me is God just used her. He just used her body. Doesn't sound very manly. Doesn't sound very masculine. Doesn't sound very virtuous. Mary is the mother of God. Joseph is the earthly stepfather of God. Chosen for that role. Imagine if somebody said your mother was not that important. That she was just a vessel that brought you into this world. Now imagine that times infinity for Christ. So the devil hates the Ten Commandments. He hates the Fourth Commandment in particular. And he hates the fact that God humbled himself and submitted himself to another, to an earthly human being. In taking on human nature, the second person of the Blessed Trinity chose a life of submitting to, obeying, and honoring mortals. Let me say that again. In taking on human nature, the second person of the Blessed Trinity chose a life of submitting to, obeying, and honoring mortals. The fact that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords obeyed the fourth commandment and submitted himself to the authority of St. Joseph on earth is incomprehensible to Satan. God lowered himself to obey and serve creatures made from dust. The filial obedience of Jesus to St. Joseph was met with the disdain of the devil. St. Joseph's fatherhood has power. The devil hates that Jesus and Mary obeyed the loving directives of St. Joseph. Now, in heaven, the intercessory power of St. Joseph possesses a serious threat to the wiles of the devil, and the devil knows it. So this is a quote from Blessed William Charbonnade. The Eternal Father shares with St. Joseph the authority which he has over the incarnate word. Just as God shared with Adam his authority over creatures. So God, the Father, shares his authority over the incarnate word, over Christ. He shares that authority. He chose to share that authority with Joseph. Crazy. This is Blessed James Alberoni. In the Holy Family, he, St. Joseph, represents the Heavenly Father. St. Madeline Sophia Barat, the two greatest personages who ever lived on earth, subjected themselves to him, St. Joseph. So the two greatest persons, 
Jesus and Mary submitted themselves to St. Joseph. St. Joseph was called by God to serve the person and mission of Jesus directly through the exercise of his fatherhood. That's St. John Paul II. Father Calloway continues, in the home of Nazareth, St. Joseph's directives were akin to paternal commands. In heaven, Jesus continues to listen to his virginal father because St. Joseph desires are always in accord with God's most holy will. Satan is terrified that St. Joseph continues to exercise paternal influence in heaven through his extraordinarily intercession with the Son of God. The devil hates God the Father and every reflection of his fatherhood. The devil hates God the Father, obviously, but he also hates every reflection of God's fatherhood, which includes St. Joseph, and that includes you, and that includes me. This hatred incites the devil to destroy fatherhood in all men, laymen as well as priests. I mean, dude, look at the scandals that are happening in the church today. Look at the scandals of all the priests. I'm not ignorant to that stuff. I know that. But it does not dissuade me or it does not create doubt in what the church and what the faith is that God created human and these men will be attacked even harder because christ knows i mean think people always say like man why does god allow you know why does god allow this to happen right i mean think about it if you if the devil can destroy the church from within he's going to try to do that and he's doing it because we're human think about it the priest is in persona Christi when he's consecrating the host to become the, the real, truly present body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And it requires a priest to do that. And if the devil can destroy these men's fatherhood, if he can destroy these men, homosexuality, pornography, molestation you name it all this stuff's going on we can't deny it and he's like if i can destroy that if i can destroy these men then i can destroy the eucharist no priest no eucharist undoubtedly the devil has a tremendous fear of zealous popes holy priests and the blood of the martyrs but he also greatly fears laymen. Laymen are just regular dudes like you and me. <laughs> Who pattern their fatherhood off of St. Joseph. The last thing the devil wants is for men to be apparitions of St. Joseph, increasing the presence of St. Joseph in the world. If a man allows himself to be an apparition of St. Joseph, imitating the virtues of St. Joseph, Satan continues to become powerless in his attacks against the family, the domestic church. So the domestic church is your family, your home, my home, my wife and children. That is my domestic. That is the domestic church. Okay. And he is powerless over those attacks. The, I believe it was uh, St. Teresa Lejeune, or maybe it was... Uh, um, St. Lucia, one of the three uh, children that saw the uh, Blessed Virgin Ma Mary in um, Fatima, which you should check out, totally approved. 70,000 witnesses of what happened. Amazing. Anyway, she said the final battle, the final battle in this lifetime will be over the family. And look at what's happening right now. When laymen, priests, and bishops pattern their paternity, when, when, when laymen, priests, and bishops pattern 
their paternal authority after that of St. Joseph, the church will experience tremendous victories over evil. It's a model. That's a model. That's a blueprint for all men right there. The loving and merciful fatherhood of St. Joseph serves as the model of all men, teaching them the proper use of paternal authority and cooperation with Jesus and Mary in the salvation of the world. The purity of St. Joseph terrorizes Satan. We talked about this. The biggest struggle with men is purity. It is a tragedy that the majority of art depicting St. Joseph has presented him as an elderly man. Sadly, sometimes he is even presented as soft and effeminate. This is far from the truth of who St. Joseph is as a man. St. Joseph is a dragon slayer. His lily is not the cane of an old man. It is the lance of a knight. Rare is the artist who has depicted the lily of St. Joseph as a sharp weapon piercing the serpent dragon. What the church needs today are images that depict St. Joseph as a dragon slayer. He worked with many tools, chopped wood, swung a sharp axe. Such images are needed in homes and churches today to convey the real fatherhood of St. Joseph. I mean, it's so true. Like you see these images of Joseph and they're these like super effeminate like images. He's like super old, like this old decrepit dude. It's like with this virgin who's like probably 13 or 15 years old. It's like, no, like think about this. Think about it. St. Joseph as it was a carpenter. The last that I checked back in the time of Jesus, there's no Home Depot. There's no Lowe's or Builder Square. <laughs> they don't have wood just pre-cut. You had to sharpen an axe, chop the tree down, carve it up, go through all of the, like, you know, you know how heavy a tree is? This was not a weak man. I picture a very fit, muscular, and capable dude. He swung an axe. He was a he was a carpenter. And I love what um, he has a quote in here. It's actually one of the readings, and it says uh, he, he quoted it from Mother Angelica. Mother Angelica, she's a founder of EWTN probably the most popular Catholic news media show, etc. And uh, she said, old men don't walk to Egypt. Boom. Joseph walked to Egypt several times a year to honor, um, to honor their religion. And I think uh, he, he, he breaks it down in here. I think Egypt like two and four, like was like 160 miles back and forth. So to go to Egypt and to come back 160 miles and mother Angelica says, old men don't walk to Egypt. So yeah, I always tripped out when, when I started thinking about those, like, you know what they do present him as this old dude. It says here, the purity of St. Joseph is a weapon against the filth and persuasions of the devil. Let me say that again. The purity of St. Joseph is a weapon. Purity is a weapon against the filth of, and the perversions of the devil. Satan is a filthy, perverse, and pornographic creature. Purity repulses him. It pierces him. And the number one sin among men today is impurity. It is a spiritual plague destroying the minds and hearts of men on a global scale. The spiritual plague of impurity involves pornography, immoral actions with oneself, homosexual acts and lifestyles, pedophilia, cohabitation, contraception, and abortion. Contraception is a big one. There's many Christians that, practice, that use contraception. That is a mortal sin. You are completing, cutting, completely cutting your life off from God using contraception because you are stopping potential life. 
these sins leave men powerless and spiritually impotent. The whole concept of the Better Man Blueprint is to help men get their power back, to help men get their sovereignty back. It is impossible to get your power back if you are impure. I know this. I've had to work my way through this entire transformation. It's, it's the reason why the five elements of a strong man came to light because I realized I had to address these, the fitness side I had together for the most part, but I had to address these other four areas of my life that were keeping me behind. And I could not get my power back until I became, until I made it a focus to be a pure and chaste husband. Men who are impure have no power. Again, you can't get your power back if you're impure. Impure men pose no threat to the devil because they are spiritually impotent. This explains why so many men today have no strength to fight evil. The devil doesn't fear many men today. Satan has nothing to fear from a man who has freely chosen to let demons into his life through lust, pornography, immoral desires, and every other form of perversion. A filthy heart blinds a person to the countenance of God. If men want to see God, and have power over darkness, they must strive to have a chaste and loving heart like St. Joseph. And then he quotes Matthew 5, 18. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. St. Joseph sees the face of God and has power over evil because he is pure. On earth, he gazed upon the face of Jesus for decades. I mean, literally, think about that. He literally looked at God for 30 years. In heaven, he gazes upon the divine countenance forever. The radiance of St. Joseph's face blinds the demons of hell. The church and the world need men who are terrors of demons. It will only happen when men imitate the purity of St. Joseph. If men do this, the world will be renewed. If priests and bishops do this, the church will be renewed. When priests and bishops have pure hearts that reflect the knight-like spirit and the warrior-like purity of St. Joseph, parishes will once again be filled with throngs of people zealous for the things of God. When bishops imitate the purity, zeal, and fatherhood of St. Joseph, mankind will once again look to the church as a moral compass of the world. That is so true because as of right now, the church has pretty much lost all moral authority. The, I mean, by their office, like the Pope and the bishops were not, by their office, by the... Um, like, what's the word here? The authority of their office is what's saving them, really. But the church has really lost a lot of its moral authority. Hiding priests, moving bishops around, doing these things. Um, it's disgusting. But all men can become terrors of demons if they imitate St. Joseph. This is with St. Francis de Sales. Valiant and strong is the man who, like St. Joseph, perseveres in humility. He will be conqueror. He will be conqueror at once of the devil and of the world, which is full of ambition, vanity, and pride. Men who want to be pure, pray. Without prayer, no one, male or female, can be pure. Pope Leo XIII understood this very well. 
At the end of the 19th century, Satan unleashed a spiritual deluge of filth, immodesty, and impurity on the world. Pope Leo XIII desired to fight it and forged together two of the greatest spiritual weapons the church has in her arsenal, the rosary and St. Joseph. This prophetic pope requested that the following prayer to St. Joseph be prayed at the end of the rosary in the month of October. So it goes through the whole prayer. The church needs to constantly invoke the aid of St. Joseph to overcome the devil. St. Joseph is more powerful in heaven than he was on earth. This is another, this is a quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. It is true that the other saints enjoy great power in heaven, but they, but they ask as servants and do not command as masters. St. Joseph, to whose authority Jesus was subject on earth, obtains what he desires from his kingly foster son in heaven. Doesn't mean that he's powerful than Jesus. No. But he attains, he attains what he asks for because Christ will always honor the fourth commandment. Honor your mother and father. Like that hasn't ended. What Jesus Christ, what could Jesus Christ refuse St. Joseph, who never refused him anything during his mortal life on earth? That's St. Augustine. What could Jesus refuse St. Joseph, who never refused him anything during his mortal life? So Joseph never refused anything to Jesus because he's God. Never refused anything to him on earth. So why would Jesus refuse anything to him in heaven? The Lord wants us to understand that just as he was subject to St. Joseph on earth, for since bearing the title of father, being the Lord's tutor, Joseph could give the child commands. So in heaven, God does whatever he commands. Since it is written that God, quote, will do the will of them that fear him, End quote. How can he refuse to do the will of St. Joseph, who nourished him for so long with the sweat of his brow? I love that. Since it is written that God will do the will of them who fear him, how can he refuse to do the will of St. Joseph, who nourished him for so long with the sweat of his brow? We must be convinced. We must be convinced that in consideration of his great merits, God will not refuse St. Joseph any grace he asks for those who honor him. The St. Alphonsus Liguori. And I'll close with one last quote here. St. Joseph, with the love and generosity with which he guarded Jesus, so too will guard your soul, and he will defend him from Herod. Let me reread that. St. <laughs> Joseph, with the love and generosity with which he guarded Jesus, so too will he guard your soul. And as he defended him from Herod, so will he defend your soul from the fiercest Herod, the devil. All the care that the patriarch St. Joseph has for Jesus, he also has for you and will always help you with his patronage. He will free you from the persecution of the wicked and proud Herod, and will not allow your heart to be estranged from Jesus. It ad Yosef. That's Latin for go to Joseph. 
Go to Joseph with extreme confidence because I do not remember having asked anything from St. Joseph without having obtained it readily. That's St. Padre Pio. So, dude, <laughs> the terror of demons. The terror of demons. St. Joseph. That is a few pages from Father Calloway's book. And so, all that to say, to close out here, to see God, we are called to observe his commandments. To love God with all your might, with all your soul, uh, to seek a life of purity by following St. Joseph's example. And all of these require commitment, i.e. discipline. To love someone is to commit to them. To love my wife, for you to love your wife is to commit to her fully, to honor her. To love God, I must make a full commitment to have no other gods, no other false idols before him. To live a life of purity, it's freaking hard. It requires a commitment. It's like you just got to make the decision. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be an easy thing. Like God did not promise it, did not pro does not promise us an easy life. In fact, he promises us a cross. And the same, here's the thing, man. The same goes for every aspect of your life. All the other elements of the strong man. The same goes for your strength training. The same goes for your eating habits. Like, you can't half-ass that stuff. You, and if you do half-ass it, you'll get nowhere fast, right? Your training requires 100% commitment to the journey, okay? And along that journey, there's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. You're going to stumble. You're, you're going to lose moments of consistency, but you're agreeing to that. I call this the better man agreement. You're agreeing to a life of uncertainty. You're agreeing to a life of, of, of struggle and suffering. Um, suffering for those who God has entrusted to you. You're agreeing to a tough life. And you're agreeing to this, going into this journey ahead of time to be a better man. To be a better man, you and I must commit to honoring the precepts of the church. We must commit to fully avoiding the near occasions of sin, which ultimately cut me off, cut you off from the life of God, leaving us in darkness where the iniquities of the wicked ensnare us, leaving us trapped in sin. The sin that we love, unfortunately. And so in every journey, there will be a moment when you encounter the mentor, right? So Jesus closes the gospel. He says, I've told you this while I'm with you, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you everything and remind you all that I told you, right? So the advocate, the mentor, and in every journey, the hero's journey cycle, we all meet the mentor, right? And it's the mentor that's going to guide you along the journey to help you develop into the man that you need to be. And it's at that point, with the help of the mentor, you make a full commitment to bringing what you've learned along the journey back to the community. And that's why community is the last and fifth element of a strong man. It's about the commitment. It's about the discipline, but you ultimately have to make that decision to be disciplined. That's it, man. Appreciate you watching. See you on the next one. Peace.